Hello. I'd like to begin by thanking everyone connected with Blue Hill Bach for giving us this wonderful annual festival, and especially this year for mounting it with the technology needed to reach out in this fashion. Indeed, our current pandemic has affected most aspects of our lives, even bringing forth new ways of creating and disseminating works of art. From amazingly coordinated Zoom concerts to lectures and virtual museum visits, the internet has assumed a crucial new role. And here I am attempting to speak to you through this technology with the help of a lot of people. Thank you. Today's artists have responded in a variety of media to make us aware of the impacts of COVID-19. In the past, the impetus for creating visual culture related to plague stemmed from a desire to stop its spread or to express thanks when an epidemic subsided. Earliest recorded history and scripture offer evidence of plagues worldwide. But to help provide some context for epidemic disease in the age of Bach, this talk will concentrate on a few examples from the truly pandemic Black Death of the 14th century to other outbreaks through the end of the 18th century. The visual arts also inform us about how early modern Europeans dealt with pandemic. We'll look at examples of how artists, architects, and their patrons reacted to plagues from the famous Black Death up to the time of the Beggar's Opera in 1728 and Bach's Christmas Oratorio in 1734. In a pre-virtual era, artists responded in modes available to them, some directly addressing the plague and its effects. Others, notably the writer Boccaccio, used the plague as a plot device for his collection of stories, the Decameron. For some artists, as we shall see, plague actually created opportunity, and many creative people also fell victim to plagues. Among them, the painters Hans Holbein and Titian, and the composer Jakob Obrecht. A family trip we took a year and a half ago precipitated my thinking about plague and art. When you take your grandchildren somewhere special, you hope that they will absorb some of the passion you feel for a place. We hoped that Italy would work its magic and that in addition to enjoying the great food and soaking up its atmosphere, some things would arouse their curiosity. And while wandering around the city, a shop window display caught our attention and provoked a question from the youngsters. Who is that striking figure with the spooky mask? Aha, time for Granny to bring up a bit of history. Discussion of the impact of bubonic plague and attempts to prevent it followed. Venice having suffered over 70 different outbreaks of epidemic disease. The men so attired were self-appointed plague doctors. More on them and their ilk a bit later. For the granddaughters, this encounter inspired eerily prophetic Halloween costumes. What is now generally referred to as the Black Death of 1346 brought a major shock to Western Europe. I am sure that most are familiar with the origins, transmission, spread, and devastating effects of that era's bubonic plague, caused by the bacterium Yersinia pestis carried by fleas on rats, as would only be discovered much, much later. It proved lethal to 40% of the population and extended its reach to Greenland, often gaining a foothold in port cities for obvious reasons, as sailors and traders brought it with them. As you can see from this list, some form of epidemic occurred with great regularity. Major outbreaks hit Milan 
in Lombardy, an early epicenter of COVID-19, in 1577. Then multiple cities on the Italian peninsula were struck from 1629 to 31. London in 1665, and the final bubonic epidemic in Western Europe hit Marseille in 1720. Although plague continued to be virulent in other parts of the world, as we should shall see. Let's now turn to some examples of art produced in relation to plague. At the time of the Black Death, artists weren't called upon to portray ordinary people or scenes of everyday life. So we have no depictions of specific individuals suffering from plague at that time. But indirectly, we can infer. Representational media often staged historical events in contemporary terms. This manuscript illumination from a 15th century German Bible illustrates the plague of boils, the sixth of the plagues inflicted on Egypt as recounted in Exodus. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, take handfuls of soot from a furnace and have Moses toss it into the air in the presence of Pharaoh. It will become fine dust over the whole land of Egypt and festering boils will break out on men and animals throughout the land. Note how the medieval illustrator drew upon his own experience with plague sores or buboes to image the boils of the biblical plague. Such images help us understand some aspects of life under plague conditions. Treatments involved both medical and spiritual remedies. Some in fact thought plagues an example of God's wrath and that certain segments of society were to blame. Jews, heretics, witches, the usual suspects. Let's first examine the spiritual approaches. Most cities had patron saints whose aid they invoked in times of danger. We must remind ourselves that many of the paintings we now encounter on the walls of museums had served liturgical functions in their original locations. Here are two examples, one still in its original place, the other now removed to a museum. One among many miraculous Madonnas can be found in Impruneta, a town outside Florence. The stiffly upright, axially positioned and frontal enthroned Madonna on the left of your screen was thought to have been painted from life by Saint Luke. The example on the right provides a glimpse of him painting her as imagined by an artist. St. Luke must have been really busy, for there are many examples claimed to have been made by his hand. These miracle working Madonnas were often brought out in processions in times of need. Such objects were central components of religious practice, and as they were used quite literally over time, their condition degraded and they needed repainting. The very medieval looking image at left actually dates from the mid 18th century. Moving to Sicily, a woman named Rosalie became Palermo's patron saint. She lived as a hermit in the wilderness near the city and died alone in 1166. In 1624, a plague hit Palermo the one in Sicily, not the one in Maine. Rosalie appeared to a hunter and indicated to him where her remains were located. She asked that he find them and have them carried where, uh, in procession throughout the city. As a result, the plague immediately ceased. The Flemish painter, Antony van Dyck, happened to be quarantined there at the time and made several paintings of Rosalie, including this one now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. It features the saint with her eyes directed heavenward 
imploring for the safety of Palermo's citizens. Soon after the quarantine lifted, Van Dyck fled, ending up in England where he revolutionized royal portraiture, as seen in this portrait of King Charles I's wife, Henrietta Maria. And his eventual fame resulted in the other images of Rosalie he made while in quarantine, now also in major museums in London, Madrid, Houston, and Puerto Rico. In addition to the civic patrons and the Virgin Mary, new saints not attached to any particular location emerged in connection with the plague and their images regularly decorated churches to help inspire worship. This idea stems from the intercessory power attributed to saints to whom prayers could be directed asking them to mediate between the human and the divine. Two saints acquired particularly associations as plague saints, and you can find numerous representations of them when you visit museums, including some at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art here in Maine. One, Saint Rock, also known as Roque, Rocco, Roche, had actual experience with pestilence. Born in France at the end of the 13th century, as a young man, he headed towards Rome on pilgrimage. On his way, he passed through towns hard hit by plague and was somehow able to cure victims. He thus typically appears dressed as a pilgrim, as in the Fra Angelico painting, at right. When stricken himself, Rock survived, so his cult grew. Italian civic life involved multiple confraternities, social service clubs like Rotary or the Lions, and those that particularly cared for plague victims generally added St. Rock's name to their organizations. The most famous of these was the Scuola di San Rocco in Venice. But here on the left, we see the saint depicted anachronistically standing in front of a confraternity headquarters in Arezzo. As stated earlier, a bad bout of plague hit Milan in 1577. When the governor and many nobles fled, the city's archbishop, Carlo Borromeo, assumed authority and provided care to the suffering people. He organized makeshift hospitals, used his own resources to provide food for the hungry, and personally attended the poor and the sick. Events commemorated frequently in many paintings, such as the monumentally composed one now on the screen peopled by classically inspired figures, with the Archbishop highly visible in red at the center and his telltale famous large nose, often remarked upon. He issued guidelines to control the outbreak, later gathering them into a book, the title page at the upper right, to help other locales in their struggles. The Milanese greatly venerated him in his lifetime, and he was canonized in 1610. The other plague saint, the martyr Sebastian, had no real connection to disease, and his efficacy against plague came from miracles he performed after his death, like Rosalie of Palermo. Born in the third century, possibly near Milan, he was a soldier. Prayers asking for his protection against plague had proven effective in various outbreaks. As you can see in this image now on the screen, one attempt to do him in when the Romans discovered his adherence to Christianity was to shoot him with arrows, and thus he was often depicted with wounds that through analogy were thought to resemble the buboes or sores associated with plague. Not only did works of art inspire devotion, 
Gaspar von Verbecke, a Flemish court musician active at the court of Milan in the late 15th century, invoked Sebastian in the text of a four-part motet that even includes a reference to Lombardy. Here we can listen to this wonderful motet as performed by an ensemble and provided to us through the graces of the Eastman School of Music. The new process of printing was the internet of the 15th century, and it enabled the production of multiple images for mass distribution. In 1472, a German, Hans Pauer, made a woodcut depicting St. Sebastian, here seen with the archers inflicting all his wounds. He added prayers at the bottom that made clear the saint's protective role. O oh, blessed Sebastian, how great is thy faith. Pray for me, thy servant, to our Lord Jesus Christ, that I may be spared the ravages of plague. Unlike paintings, such sheets could be purchased by many and carried on one's person. 
plague and other serious illnesses recurred on a regular basis. Let's look at another example of a religious narrative that referenced the 6th century AD plague of Justinian, the first pandemic in the Western world, but illustrated in contemporary terms in this 15th century painting. Audiences then were accustomed to viewing multiple episodes take place within a single frame. We witness a ceremony of burial of plague victims, but here the grave digger, himself inflicted, has fallen to the ground in agony and invokes St. Sebastian's help in interceding for his own life as seen in the upper left-hand corner. Turning now to medical solutions, let's go back to those plague doctors who inspired these thoughts of mine in the first place. Holding no specific qualifications, man assumed this attire and circulated in plague-infested locations. They wore a leather robe and their mask had glass-covered openings for the eyes. The curved beak, closely modeled on those of birds, had likewise two small holes for breathing. The mask functioned as a kind of respirator, as it was filled with herbs and spices meant to filter the bad air that was thought to spread disease. This kind of PPE, seems to anticipate more modern modes of protection. But the notion then was that the wearer needed protection from smells emanating from the sick. That is to say, bad air, or in Italian, malaria, the name malaria, ascribed to the disease that was then thought to emerge from the malodorous air given off by unhealthy swamps but which we now know was mosquito-borne. These doctors carried long sticks in order to examine victims without touching them. Also, they used an iron to cauterize plague buboes, those swollen inflamed lymph nodes in the armpit, neck, or groin. Here too, the long handle allowed the physician or the amateur to keep his distance. Torches like this one seen at right, like the beak mask, would have been similarly loaded with aromatics, lit, and carried for protection against plague. In 1665, over 100,000 victims may have died of the disease in London alone. Again, both the buboes caused by the disease and the breath of the dying really stank, and it was thought that these rancid smells were what spread the malady. Eau de Cologne, a scent, in fact, may have been invented at this time as another means of protection against the plague. Its recipe, which included rosemary and citrus essences suspended in a grape-based spirit, could be applied to the body in order to ward off noxious vapors. Medical professionals and lay people, including women, formulated medicines. Archives are full of such recipes that were often closely guarded secrets. When made up, the compounds were kept in containers that reflected their value and no doubt influenced them, those taking them, as to their efficacy. Diascodrium, stored in a jar like the one at the upper left, was a thick liquid preparation with a consistency similar to honey. You can see where these medicines were kept out of easy reach in a sick room depicted at the time of the London Plague of 1665. There were different recipes for, for Diascodrium, and some included opium. It was recommended not just for plague, but was also used to treat diarrhea, dysentery, colic, fevers, and was recommended for women during childbirth. Because the exact nature of the causes and courses of illnesses 
were poorly understood. Many deaths in the Middle Ages and Renaissance were thought to stem from poisons. Some thought that plague resulted from malicious poisoning of wells, although probably no one needed to do that as water supplies were hardly germ-free. Remedies against poisons, therefore, were also in high demand. Theriac was an antidote to snake venom and other poisons, as with Mithridate, supposedly formulated by the eponymous king of Pontus, Mithridate, about whom Mozart composed an early opera seria. The Sick Room is one of nine engravings by John Dunstall that illustrate what Londoners would have experienced in 1665, the Great Plague, the last major bubonic outbreak in England. He illustrated nurses caring for the sick, houses shut and marked to keep occupants in quarantine, the wealthy fleeing the city, seemingly endless burials, and survivors returning after the decline in plague deaths. What he didn't yet know, of course, was that the city would be set by a great fire the following year. Fifty some years later, Daniel Defoe wrote a novel in the form of a journal as if written during London's Great Plague. But Samuel Pepys, a naval administrator and MP, portrayed it right, actually kept a detailed diary at the time. It makes for great reading or listening on audiobooks for all of its juicy details. Here's one example from Sunday through 3 September 1665, while the Great Plague raged. Up and put on my colored silk suit, very fine, and my new periwig, bought a good while since, but durst not wear, because the plague was in Westminster, part of Greater London, when I bought it. And it is a wonder what will be the fashion after the plague is done, as to periwigs, for nobody will dare to buy any hair for fear of infection, that it had been cut off the heads of people dead of the plague. Another spiritual approach to combating epidemic disease involved making a vow, a kind of bargain with the divine. When plagues subsided, and to thank the forces that had interceded in their behalf, ex votos resulted, items of expressive culture ranging from small tokens to large public monuments and churches to performances. The Obramago Passion Play originated in fulfillment of a vow made during the plague ep epidemic of 1633. You might be surprised at how many churches and other structures have resulted from such vows, so here are a few. An early architectural example is the chapel dedicated to the Virgin built in Siena's main square at the conclusion of the Black Death. Not attached to any religious building, it figures prominently in the city's main square, the Campo, directly in front of the city hall, as seen in this painting depicting a local friar, later made a saint, preaching. Venice had several votive churches because it was hit by plague more than any other city. The Church of the Redeemer, Il Redentore, built in 1577, was built in thanksgiving for deliverance from a major outbreak of the plague that struck the lagoon between 1575 and 76, in which some 46,000 people, 25% of the population, died. The Venetian Senate commissioned the architect Andrea Palladio to design the votive church on the Giudecca Island across from the Zattere. But plague struck Venice again, as we'll see in the next slide. Beginning in the summer of 1630, a new wave of plague 
assaulted Venice and again killed nearly a third of the population. Repeated prayers and processions to churches dedicated to St. Roque and St. Sebastian did not, however, stem this epidemic. As a votive offering for the city's deliverance, the Republic of Venice upped the ante by vowing to build and dedicate a new church to the Virgin Mary, the prime intercessor, to be called the Church of St. Mary of Health or Santa Maria della Salute, Salute also connoting deliverance. Baldassare Longhena designed this landmark, I'm sure familiar to all, as it sits on the Grand Canal. Titian had painted the altarpiece at right for another location in 1510, at the time of yet another epidemic. It features Venice, Venice's patron saint, Mark, enthroned at the center, with the plague saints Rock and Sebastian at right, together with the doctor saints Cosmas and Damien at the left, connecting all the city's potential protectors. It has now appropriately been moved to the interior of the Salute. In addition to examples we've seen in Italy, monuments arose in many other places that had suffered from significant plague episodes. In 1697, Vienna was visited by one of the last big plague epidemics. Fleeing the city, the Habsburg Emperor Leopold I nevertheless vowed to erect a mercy column if the epidemic would end. Completed only in 1694, the Pestzoila, or plague column, certainly embodies the era's Baroque exuberance. As we've seen, epidemics of bubonic plague devastated Europe from the 14th through the 18th centuries. But another disease had a huge impact as well, smallpox. Not considered plague because it became endemic, meaning it was always present. It flared up from time to time, and it was caused by a virus, the variola, not a bacterium like bubonic plague. This disease was a constant Europe-wide worry in the time of Bach and the Beggar's Opera. Look at this chart that shows smallpox deaths in London from the 17th through the 19th centuries. A huge percentage of the populace caught the disease and recovered, but there was a steady rate of deaths averaging around 15%. Everyone worried. Our best visual evidence of the appearance of smallpox in the early modern period comes not from a European example, but from Mexico. Here we see 16th century Nahua people infected with smallpox brought by their European invaders, an image included with other materials describing life in that newly conquered realm, compiled to inform Europeans about it. And as we all know, Native Americans did not have antibodies against such diseases, so fell quickly victim to smallpox and measles over the following centuries. In the 18th century alone, several European monarchs and their heirs died from smallpox, greatly affecting dynastic succession. Louis XIV's son and heir, known as the Grand Dauphin, on the upper left, predeceased his father because of smallpox. His own son, the Petit Dauphin, Louis XIV's grandson, died of measles. So it was, in fact, the Sun King's great-grandson, Louis XV, at the bottom center, who was his successor. And he, too, died of smallpox. We know from letters exchanged among ruling families how many within that group were infected with smallpox. Portraiture from the period generally flattered the ruling elite, but we have an unusual record of Medici Grand Duke Ferdinando II made during the course of his bout with smallpox, from which he recovered. 
His sister wrote a letter the following year asking for his portrait to show this recovery. An agent informed her that the painter, Justus Sustermans, was at work on one and that when it was finished, a copy would be made and sent to her. He further explained that it made no sense to have a copy made from an earlier portrait of Ferdinando made prior to the smallpox because, quote, that portrait no longer resembles the Grand Duke. This disease must have severely altered his appearance, but we rarely see pockmarks depicted. We have a series of women to thank for their support of remedies against smallpox. Lady Mary Pierpont contracted smallpox herself in December 1715 at the age of 26. The portrait at right was painted the following year. In her youth, she had educated herself by using the family library and she would become a writer among other things. She married Edward Wortley Montague and in London, the couple were a great success at court, befriending a number of influential people, including John Gay, author of The Beggar's Opera. She accompanied her husband on his assignment as ambassador to Turkey and there witnessed something totally new, variolation. Two Greek women engaged in the practice of pricking people's skin with a needle and inserting material taken from a mildly infected smallpox victim. As a result, they did not get infected. Lady Mary was very impressed and wanted her children to be so treated and to bring the method back to England. But the procedure was not without risk. King George II's consort, Caroline of Anspach, promoted research into the disease of smallpox. A survivor herself, it nearly killed her eldest daughter. She commissioned a series of experiments on orphans and condemned criminals. But when all of them survived, she had her own children inoculated and shortly after required the presence of these children at busy court occasions, dancing for the assembled company to demonstrate that they remained healthy and that the procedure was to be encouraged in a wider society. Carolyn, by the way, was a musician herself and a great patron of Handel. Catherine II of Russia, also a great patron of art and music, she even wrote opera libretti herself, and managed to attract composers like the Venetian Baldassare Galuppi to her own court, also promoted inoculation. An English doctor traveled to Russia in 1762, the year that this portrait of her was painted, to treat her and her son, Paul, and several members of the court. She chose to be the first to be inoculated. She insisted, actually, as she wanted to serve as an example to her people. She developed a mild case of smallpox that was gone in 10 days, and we all know how much she accomplished in the rest of her reign. Variolation or inoculation was risky, and some inoculated people succumbed to the disease. The British royal family continued to advocate for the practice, but then two of George the third and Queen Charlotte of mecklenburg strelitzs 15 children died after undergoing the procedure. The eldest six are included with them in this portrait. Queen Charlotte, who herself was a great patron of music, Johann Christian Bach being her music master, and for whom the young Mozart performed while on tour, then turned to support the work of Dr. Edward Jenner. His research was based on a different methodology. Instead of inoculation with matter from someone infected with smallpox itself, he advocated for what became known as vaccination, 
using the related but less virulent cowpox. That virus was safer and provided effective protection against the human disease. The word vaccination derives from the Latin for cow, vacca. And this connection is what caused the concern seen here in James Gilray's satirical cartoon, now on the screen, in which wary Londoners crowded into a room to receive vaccinations fear that they will acquire bovine features or that many cows will start to sprout from their bodies. Arrows indicate a few examples in this crowded composition. This was the idea promoted by the anti-vaccine society of its day. Luckily for the planet, this was not a result of vaccination and worldwide vaccination in fact resulted in the elimination of smallpox 175 years later by 1977. Let's close with a final look at an image concerning bubonic plague, still rampant in the Middle East at the end of the 18th century. Upon his return journey from his Egyptian campaign, Napoleon commissioned this large-scale painting, measuring 17 by 23 feet, of himself visiting French soldiers infected with bubonic plague in Jaffa, in Syria in 1779. It garnered great public acclaim at its official presentation at the large public Parisian exhibition, the Salon of 1804. In a composition exploiting contrasts between light and dark, while some hold handkerchiefs over their mouths and noses, the unmistakable general at center ignores professional advice to keep his distance and approaches a patient, even touching one of his sores as the doubting Thomas had touched the wound in the side of Christ. As you will recall, it was thought that bubonic plague thread spread through the air and that such closeness, especially touch, incurred great risk. It would be another century before the true culprit, the flea, would be recognized. So in fact, despite their precautions, anyone depicted here risks, risked infection equally. It is unclear that such an event actually took place, but it served as a clear piece of propaganda for Napoleon, who by the time of its painting and display had become first council and who would shortly be crowned, or I should say would crown himself emperor. It countered accusations by the British press who claimed that he'd actually steered clear of this hospice and left orders that lethal doses of morphine as a form of euthanasia uh, should be administered on his retreat from Cairo. Thank you all very much for your attention. I've prepared a list of additional resources for you to explore that will be available on the Blue Hill Bach website. I hope that when this COVID danger passes, we can all gather soon again in person to participate in the wonderful events offered by Blue Hill Bach. Thank you again.